up, we have Paolo Teixeira, one of the first employees in Macarena, and since then, the company's lead in research and development innovation. Paulo has a PhD in bioengineering and a background in startup entrepreneurship, a passion for technology innovative, and innovative products. So please, could you uh, start sharing your presentation and introduce us to Macarena's work? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you much, so much for the introduction. Thank you, everyone. And it's been a wonderful, uh, let's say, a wonderful event so far. I've been uh, listening to, to both talks before me. And uh, yeah, it's been quite, uh, quite nice to see everything that is uh, aligned also a bit with what I'm going to talk about. So um, I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, mycoprotein and uh, creating protein, fungi-based protein from mycelium. And this is because this is what we do at Mycarena. So um, uh, I'm initially joined Mycarena basically when the company started. So I'm a, a bit part of the, the founding team and I've been leading the innovation and R&D part of it. So I can talk, uh, but I can talk a bit about all sort of things. I'm also looking forward for the Q&A in the end and for the, for the networking sessions. So let me put a bit things in context and why is mycoprotein so relevant nowadays? I mean, if you start looking at how the world population will grow and how we are growing right now, well, there's a ton of different scenarios we can really follow of uh, how this world population is going to grow to. But most of them point towards a huge growth. Uh, and, you know, with the more people comes the necessity to actually feed all these people. Uh, and if we look at how we are doing it today, well, uh, looking at, for example, the distribution of how we use land to produce food, uh, we already are using around 70% uh, of all the habitable land to actually produce uh, produce food. And that's, um, well, 70% of the habitable land, we are using it um, uh, for different purposes of all uh, the habitable land we have, half of it is actually for, for agriculture. And when you say agriculture, it's a mix of uh, animals and plant production. Um, but out of that, 77% uh, is actually for livestock. So uh, we are using a lot of land to produce animals. And if you think about how we're going to grow um, more in, in the coming years and how you're going to feed all these people, and if you need to double and triple your food production, uh, it's really complicated to do it based on the dietary consumptions that we're having today. Uh, furthermore, I mean, what we are using in terms of water uh, is also quite extensive. So we're using uh, a lot of the water we already use is for agriculture and already large parts of the world are, are having scarcity of water. So you cannot have agriculture all over there. You have problems with centralization of agriculture where you need to produce food in only certain region regions of the globe and then ship it all over all over the all over the place more than that if you think about um, for example the climate impact of current protein sources and uh, if we think about how much meat we are eating uh, you can see that this is tens of times more uh, carbon emissions that we get out of producing meat then we get out of making plants. So, you know, keep feeding this world population on animals uh, more and more sounds like a pretty bad idea. And we need to find good plant-based sources and, uh, and we have been having a lot of plant-based sources on the market. The problem is uh, a lot of times plants don't really let these food manufacturers to see, succeed with providing uh, alternatives. They're either having, for example, when you have uh, extruded uh, materials or uh, isolated plant proteins, a lot of times, for example, the taste uh, has a lot of unpleasant factors to it and you need to mask it with excess sugars, excess salt, um, what you call uh, flavor maskers, which are molecules that interact with your mouth in a particular way. Uh, all of this is, requires a lot of processing. Uh, and then you have the texture part, which is also talking about processing you really need to when you, to process plant-based proteins to get this this texture as it was already told about today plant-based sources are not really made to have these fiber textures so when you we, we need to do that well you basically have a ton of chemical uh, extraction processes you have uh, high pressure and high temperatures that mechanically and artificially align protein uh, so all of this comes also with a price so um the whole thing just seems like very complicated uh, to kind of like take away the animals that we are eating. 
Uh, and this is because we are not really willing to compromise and we want something that's that still gives us a bit the meaty feeling uh, without uh, without really, yeah, without having to take away our taste and texture that we so really like in this product. But what alternatives do you really have? We have, talk, we have talked, of course, uh, here today uh, that the alternatives to plants can be, for example, the cultured meat, where you have uh, the real animal cells done in a more sustainable way, in an ethical way, um, but still a bit far away from the market in some ways or still not price accessible or, or still have a very, a lot of many challenges actually to solve there. Uh, we also have other things like insects, for example. We could eat insects, which yes, they are animals, but they are an extremely resource efficient way to making protein. Other things like fermentation processes involving bacteria, bacteria in the yeast, which also have their own sensorial challenges. And then what we actually think it's one of the best options that we have at the moment for this case is fungal protein. Uh, fungal protein is also produced for, from fermentation, but we see as having a lot of advantages related to, to other protein sources at the moment. And when we think about fungi, we actually are used to, to thinking about mushrooms, of course. But uh, fungi in food is not only mushrooms. I mean, if you think about cheese, you will see a lot of a lot of fungi. In, for example, the blue cheese, which all those like blue parts are actually fungi growing in it. Um, the brie, for example, where you have the the outside white part, fluffy part, that's all like fungal organisms growing there. One very um, kind of typical, or well, not very typical in Europe, but typical in Indonesia, where it's been consumed in Europe quite a lot, is uh, tempeh which is essentially soybeans that are fermented by fungi. And all the white part is, is basically the fungal mycelium, the fungal organisms that are growing around the soybeans. So all of these uh, foods have been uh, using microfungi to grow on it. So they grow on these foods and we eat it in, in consider considerable amounts. So we are kind of used to this as a food source. More than that, they are extremely resource efficient. Um, and it has been said before, and we'll, we'll look a bit into more the numbers of our process, for example, where we get, you know, over 90% efficiency compared to, to cultivating animals. Um, so if we talk about microprotein and about fungi, I mean, in the whole, all the words, uh, you will also hear very often being told about mycelium. And all of this uh, is a lot of words that mean different things around the same topic. So I just wanted to kind of like tell you a bit about, about what everything means here. When we talk about a fungi, we're talking about the whole organism. So in the same way that you have a plant, that you have a tree, I mean, you have, you have an organism that's a plant and this is a fungi. So when you talk about mycoprotein, uh, the term can mean protein from fungi, but that can be misleading because then you think, okay, am I taking the protein away from the fungi and extracting it like I'm doing with plant proteins? No, that's not the case. Uh, when you talk about microprotein, it means you're actually eating the whole fungi in, in one way. So you're not doing any extraction processes. You're growing an organism. You're eating it in a very similar way to what we do with agriculture. Instead of growing plants, we're growing fungi. Uh, and the part here, when we talk about mycelium, we're talking about the structure or the part of the fungi that we actually eat. So if you think, for example, about the mushrooms that you find in, uh, in the forests or so, uh, when you find the mushrooms, you're actually getting the fruiting body. So it's kind of like if you have a tree, you're taking the apple from it, which is just a part that is allowing the organism to reproduce. But below the ground, below that mushroom that you collect, there's a whole network of, uh, of what you call hyphae, which is just like a root-like structure uh, that is highly rich in nutrients. It's uh, highly... So highly nutritious, and it's actually like the body of the fungi is that mycelium. So it's growing in the ground, and you're just seeing popping up like the little fruiting bodies. So fungi, you can actually eat the whole thing. You can eat the fruiting bodies, but you can also eat the mycelium part. And uh, when we talk about mycoprotein, we're often talking about mycelium that is produced from microfungi. So the same type of fungi that will grow on cheese or in tempeh or something. Uh, we are growing this fungi in essentially in a very large scale, uh, and we're getting this mycelium and eating it, uh, like basically preparing it to be a food. So you're eating the whole organism, which is very high uh, in protein. So like the dry matter 
of these mycelia is usually 45 to 65 percent protein. The rest is like fibers and carbohydrates and very low on fat with basically no sugars on it. So it's um, it's a highly nutritious, a highly complete protein. So there's all the essential amino acids that you usually need in a human diet. Uh, and it has kind of a natural texture to it. Because if you think about this, this structure, this network of, of hyphae and my, of roots, let's say, it has a fibrousness to it that you can use as a natural texture instead of you know, chemically processing like you do in plant proteins. But is this something like very new and very uh, weird, let's say, that we're eating now? Well, not really. Uh, if you think about uh, what's in the market and what's being done, uh, in the 60s, uh, you, you can tell you a bit the story of how the first brand of microprotein came to the market, and this is not our brand for sure, it's someone else's. So uh, in the 60s in the UK, uh, there was this uh, British companies and uh, there was a government call where they were like, okay, we're running our protein in the world. We need to find new ways to do it. And there was different ways to do it. But there was these companies where they started looking at fungi that could grow in the, that would find in the grounds and so. And they started looking at different fungi. Can we grow anything that is like resource efficient and fast and can give us a lot of protein in, in a very like easy way? So they found a couple of species and found some that would be safe for consumption, they would be healthy to eat, etc. Uh, and they for formed this company called Marlow Foods, uh, which later formed as the corn brand. Um, and to 84 and 85, they got everything authorized by the UK government and released this brand in the market over. Uh, so they started with some kind of weird products like this savory pie and so that nobody really knew what it was. But then later, really, the following 20 years or so, they've spread in the market as uh, mince products, as chicken-like products. Um, and I, up to very recently, actually, it was the only microprotein brand in the market. Only that recently, all this technology silo that was hosted by Quorn under the form of a lot of patents, 20 years later, all the patents expire. So the technology became kind of like available for other people to come in and to explore into a lot of other species, other products, and really take this validated technology that has been in market for like 20 years or 30 years even, and start to do other things with it. That's where now uh, around yeah, 20, 2010, 2012, you can start to see a few brands and up to now, basically you've been seeing a lot of brands popping up for new microprotein. So that's what a bit what we call the next generation microprotein companies. And basically all of it among startup companies. Uh, some of them in Europe, probably more even in the US, uh, but that's where the core is. And we are uh, a microprotein company, a next generation microprotein company based in Sweden. Uh, we were founded in 20, 2017. Um, and we have also introduced our own microprotein brand to the market recently. So in the next years, what we, we do see is that large, company, large companies are also wanting to enter the market and big, big food brands uh, want to take microprotein mainstream and they're working with companies like us to make that happen. So we do see that is, this is going a bit exponential and it's gonna be a widespread of microprotein use among different food companies, industries and countries worldwide. So, why really are, why is this happening? Why is a food company, why are food companies interested in microprotein? Well, for one thing, uh, from everything I said, the sustainability aspects, the low resource usage. So you can do something that is, uh, you know, you can provide vegan sources without uh, extreme resource use in a completely new way. Um, but also, for example, you can do local production. So you can produce this anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world you can produce a, put a bioreactor and set the fermentation plant and make microprotein happen essentially. And the other parts related to the product itself is uh, the health and nutrition of it. So uh, there's a, I mean, it's a very good product itself, as I said, high protein and fiber. Uh, it has no anti-nutrients or allergens. And, uh, and it essentially you have a texture and a taste that is novel and better than current alternatives. So you have a unique texture that is different from current sources. You have no off tastes, uh, so it's a very neutral base that you get to work with. And in the end, it's a healthy product. So uh, if you look at the research around microprotein, you'll see that it's a low-fat product. There's a lot of dietary fiber that is good as prebiotics. 
Uh, it's great for like uh, amino acid supply and muscle building, but also helps control blood sugar, society, and cholesterol levels. So it's essentially a very highly regarded uh, ingredient product to work with. A bit about us and our role in the middle of all of this. Uh, at Micarena, we are about 30 people now. Uh, we're situated in Sweden and we have currently a pilot facility in Gothenburg where we produce about 40 tons of microprotein a year. So growing fungi in quite a, lar quite a large scale. Uh, and we have been brought here by private investment, of course, as any other startup company um, with, uh, with a couple of rounds raised and still uh, increasing our, our prospects. And our mission is really to build technology solutions that are fungi-based and can make an impact in the global food system. It starts with microprotein, but really can go beyond that. We have started in uh, 2017, and then uh, in 2018, we got our first funding. We formed our first uh, like initial team. We were five people in 2019 when we released Promic uh, as our flagship microprotein product. And we started really to try to put that in the market uh, in uh, I don't know in any way that we knew it could it could be used or it could be interesting to do. And at the time, there wasn't many competitors to us. Um, it was kind of like in 2020 that we started uh, things started flying. Let's say uh, we moved on to a pilot plant which we managed to build here in Gothenburg. Uh, this one now where we are, where we can have 40 tons yearly of production, and we uh, managed to put our first product in the more supermarket shelf. So we worked with the biggest Swedish. Um, biggest Swedish supermarket chain. And in a collab tight collaboration, we produced these uh, chicken-like nuggets that we were able to place in a couple of different stores, uh, many boxes that went out, and we were able to get a lot of feedback and customer acceptance and really validate our whole uh, business model. Um, so we right now um, keep on kind of like growing in that sense. And uh, we are currently further growing our pilot facility. So this is what you call MIND. So it's Microarena Innovation and Development Center, uh, where we have, um, where we are able to both develop new products, but also keep expanding our commercial traction on Promic. And when I say other solutions beyond Promic, I'm talking, yeah, that we do both Promic, but also we do fungi-based solutions for the food industry. So I'm gonna talk a bit about this later, but um, our business model is essentially to uh, yeah produce Promic here and produce Promic at a commercial scale, uh, work with food manufacturers that will use this as a base ingredient, uh, replacing current plant-based sources and animal sources and create consumer food products that they can put in a supermarket shelf. So we want to reach a very large sector of, of audiences by working with food manufacturers that are able to take our ingredients into several different brands, several different products, and really place that right next to the consumer. Uh, we do this through a fermentation process that takes around 24 hours from starting the reactor to harvesting the biomass. It takes us, uh, yeah, basically takes us a day to build this whole thing, which if you compare to months taken for agriculture processes. It's a, it's very interesting turnover time. And we have some simple mild processing, which basically means treating this so it's safe, so it's uh, kind of clean, and that we can like remove, for example, any remainings of the media that have like, like off taste and so, and kind of align it in the right texture just to give it like a really meaty feeling to the final product, which you can then supply to our customers in many different ways. And this customer has been, as I said, everything from, from ECA, as I talked about, but other food manufacturer companies, like uh, this is a couple of like different Swedish brands and manufacturers, but we also have been working a lot with restaurants to gain traction and, uh, and put a lot of final food products that we can produce ourselves and really put it out to the consumers to really reach people in the best way possible, in the fastest way possible. Uh, while we gain traction on the commercial scale of parts and really on, on putting that together with, with food companies. And when I talk about those final food products, that can be anything from, you know, meatballs and burgers to kind of tuna-like products or uh, protein bars. Uh, and this is just other, like, nice examples of things we have done, actually, with our products. So all of these were products made with our, our protein source. 
looking at the sustainability of uh, of the products, well, uh, you can see there, for example, on the land use parts, uh, you see all the all the beef and pork and chicken, and then even soy protein, and you can see the land use that it takes to produce promic. And this is including the substrates that we need to grow the fungi. So all the feeding that we do to the fungi using sugars and so, this is everything that we do uh, counts much better or like has uses a lot, lot less land than uh, current plant and animal-based sources. Same thing with water use um, and CO2 emissions. It's also kind of as good as current, for example, pulses and soy protein. Um, we talked a bit, something I should uh, bring up here. It's not part of our main business model, but it will be, it's very interesting to talk about this sort of additional innovations we do. Uh, we talked in the beginning also about circular processes. And uh, this is something also that we do uh, besides, uh, besides Promic, we do innovations where we work with circular microprotein, but also alternative uses of fungi. And I think the circular microprotein part is something very interesting to talk about because uh, we are able to essentially use waste resources from food industries to create our microprotein. So we run projects sometimes with particular companies uh, where we can, for example, if we take a, a case where we were, uh, well, we already went public with this information, which is from this food producer, Pilar Broad, uh, where they have a ton of bread waste, we're able to produce microprotein from these bread wastes and uh, produce products that they can use in their own, for example, uh, sandwich fillers. For example, They can use some ham replacement that they can use back in their sandwiches as their food product. So we can set kind of uh, uh, interesting circularity cases where we have also done it through EU projects uh, where this is possible. Um, but then again, this is like something we do as a, a side, uh, in a side structure rather than our main business model focus. It's more of um, something we want to really adopt in the future in a very large scale and that we are paving the path to be able to do that sometime. So I'm kind of ended up here, just a bit of, uh, of uh, showing a bit our, our traction in terms of uh, media and getting a lot of media attention. So it's been great to be part of this journey. Um, and I kind of just want to finish by uh, showing you a bit of what's going to come up. So we are now working on building our full commercial launch uh, by building a full commercial production factory which will produce several thousands of tons of fungi protein uh, every year. The building is already being built, so everything is on track to be operational end of 2022, where we really hope to be able to take what we've done so far to a whole new level and scale it up uh, all across Europe uh, and then eventually globally. Thank you, everyone, for today. Looking forward for the, for the Q&A session. Thank you for such an amazing presentation. Yeah, the company looks amazing, the factory. And uh, it's actually been very interesting to hear about the whole uh, circle loop you're doing with the bread producer. It's amazing that you can do mm -hmm. something like that. We actually have a lot of questions. Uh, so firstly, um, uh, can we use fungi for modification of plant proteins and improve functionality and palatability of the plant protein? Yeah, that is something that you can actually do. And we've had a lot of, um, we've been having a conversation actually uh, and related to that. So fungi have a, a very wide toolbox of things that can do. And one of them is to, to yeah, really, if you incubate it with plant-based sources, you can start degrading particular things that uh, maybe it's hard for us humans to digest, for example. So you can actually improve the digestibility of plant-based sources using fungi te fermentation technology. Okay, thank you. That's sort of like a uh, tempe. You, mm -hmm. I think you talk essentially. About. <laughs> that's that's what you do with tempe. Yeah, you're uh, you're making the the soybeans better for you, kind of. Everyone was very um, interested in all the different products uh, microprotein can be, and um, can we actually um, use it to make dairy drinks enrichment, like protein drinks, or is it is there a poss possibility to extract the protein for from micro? Mm -hmm. The yeah, there is definitely the possibility for that. Um, but then again, we, we fall into a bit like further processing and extraction, because if we think about microprotein in the pure sense, well, it's the whole fungal cell. So you can't really dissolve that in a, in a liquid 
uh, in a way that it doesn't become grainy or, or so. So you do need additional processing. Uh, again, one of the things that we've been working a bit on the on the background that uh, we know it is possible. We kind of know how to do it. Uh, we have some some intellectual property on it even. So so definitely it's something you can do. Yeah, it sounds very interesting as an alternative to regular mm. protein drinks. Um, uh, what would you say was the the biggest problem uh, with the with the patent? Why did uh, what were the limits of doing microprotein research and putting it in foods when the corn patents were in place? Well, um, well, they held basically patents claiming the whole process of making food from uh, from fungi mycelia. So, um, any company that would try to do it, they would just be infringing it essentially. So they could be you know, brought to court because you are infringing on, on an existing patent. So, so it was pretty narrow what you could actually do. Um, but now, yeah, now it's, yeah, it, you're pretty much allowed to, and there's a lot of still new things to, to patent and to, to do, but, uh, the concept of making a meat replacement product or a protein product, uh, using fungi as a protein source, that's, that's something you're allowed to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, could you alter the texture for all uses, for example, chicken, beef, fish, bacon, etc., or is just uh, this chicken-like texture? You've shown us uh, many photos of very different dishes, actually. So, how is it possible that you create something like that from mycelium? Um, well, there is different ways you can do it. So. Um... Let's say there's, uh, yeah, that's something we've been working a lot. And it's kind of like you can do it on the mycelium itself. So you can try to to work the mycelium so it, you kind of get the right textures by combining it with the right things. So again, it's a lot of back to functional ingredients also. But also we know that by growing the fungi in different ways, it can grow in different structures. So that also helps you modulate. Uh, texture, but a lot of times it comes down to the to the way you formulate it in the end. How do you mix it? How do you process it? Like, do you you know do you grind it before mixing something, or like which order do you do things is also important. So um, there's a lot of fine tuning, a lot of like process development uh, that really can bring in it. And some things we are still trying to figure out how to do it because it's uh, yeah it's not easy to to do any texture that uh, is created by a you know, an animal muscle is, is a very complicated texture to to simulate. Yeah, and when we're at that uh, point, uh, what are the gelling ability? Like, what are the functional ingredients microprotein has that makes it similar to meat, or what should be improved, and how can we improve that? Um, well, the interesting thing is there's not many functional properties that are the same as meat. Uh, it's more of a macro structure thing. So essentially the, the fungal fibers, you get a whole cell that is a fiber on its own. So it's about how you work with those fibers uh, because the proteins are inside, but the proteins are not really doing much to it. Uh, it's the whole cells that you're working with. So you're working with a fiber structure that is not actually a protein structure. Uh, so that is the thing that is becomes very tricky because suddenly you have to work with it in a completely different way that you work with considering plant protein isolates and so. Um, so that is the part that brings you to, to a meat-like uh, texture. However, uh, there's a lot of challenges I also need to solve in terms of um, how to make it, you know, if you want a gel structure, you need to work with this in unconventional ways to get there. Um, or put it together with other ingredients that uh, that gel. For example, if you look at corn products, until very recently, they all contain egg protein. And why is that? Because you need a gelling agent. Um, so how you work with it really depends on what you get. And you know, we found out basically that there's there's a lot of different paths to go to the, to the same thing. That's why there are many companies now working in this sector. And I'm pretty sure everyone is doing it differently. Yeah, it sounds very, very interesting to do something that innovative. And one final question, a quick one. Uh, when can we expect 
my Karina to come to other parts of Europe and even the world? Uh, quite soon, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> now, right now, we're having quite a strong market traction in, uh, in Sweden. And we are kind of, uh, I mean, as we build our commercial capacity, uh, we are kind of getting booked for the capacity we already are, are building. So uh, we will, basically, we will start with supplying Sweden for now. Um, but we already have a lot of commercial interest in testing across other European countries. So, I mean, it's really, and the challenge a lot of times is also, you know, getting investment to support this building, you know, building a commercial production plant is it's crazy expensive. So you need to be able to attract this investment. Um, and that's usually the part that is that is preventing you to speed up sort of. Uh, and there's also a lot of stuff that needs to be solved on the process, of course, and then to work on. But uh, but yeah, but it's we will. Yeah, we'll get we'll get there as soon as we can. <laughs> okay, We're very excited to see what my Karina has in store for us later. Thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you.